Hello, friends. Thank you for joining us here at our online presence of First Presbyterian Church in Sterling, Illinois. We're so glad that you've come to our YouTube channel to watch our videos and to join with us in worship and celebration of this life we have and the God that we serve. We have been um, doing a series on Sabbath keeping, and this will be our fourth and final week of that. And so one of the things I want to share with you today is a Sabbath moment. We did this in the worship service. You can do this anytime. And it's a very simple practice that often um, we can use to help us center ourselves, to calm ourselves, and to find just a moment of Sabbath rest, no matter what the circumstance. So as we begin to move into this last of this series on Sabbath, I want to invite you to join with me in this Sabbath moment. It's very, very simple. It begins with you breathing. You don't have to do any kind of special breathing. Just breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Just the way you always breathe. Just keep breathing. In fact, um, often I, when I'm talking with people in pastoral counseling and care that are in times of stress or anxiety, one of the things I remind them is to just keep breathing. Just keep breathing. This particular way of breathing invites us to kind of focus our energy and our thoughts on a particular phrase. So the one we used in worship is this one. As you breathe in, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You might want to try that, or you might also want to try this one. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Or you've heard these phrases from me many times, and these are another set of phrases you might use. You might breathe in and then say, I am worthy, I am loved. Breathe out, I am enough. I am worthy, I am loved. I am enough. I suggest that when you try this, you do it around 10 times, depending on how much time you have available, and make it a regular practice as you would a meditation or prayer or time with scripture or other kinds of things you do each day. And I hope that it will help you find a moment's rest even when life seems really crazy busy and turbulent. So God bless you. Thank you for coming to be with us. And do know that we join with you in the belief that you are worthy and you are loved and you are enough. this um, fourth and final week of this series on Sabbath, we're going to return to the synagogue with Jesus. 
We have considered the goodness of the gift of Sabbath. We have um, thought about how it was given to us in creation and renewed in the wilderness when the Israelites were wandering. We've considered the need for rest and the rhythms of life that God ordains. And we've considered the wider and wider patterns that lead to Sabbath rest, even for the land and the restoration of property and um, debt forgiveness even. So we've circled back around kind of to um, individual honoring of the Sabbath as we hear a story of an individual woman who was stricken with some kind of chronic illness that makes her unable to stand up straight. Just as in a previous week, we heard Jesus saying, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This week, we're reminded of what is right and proper in the divine view for the keeping and honoring of Sabbath. So let's listen for God's word to us in the gospel according to Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands upon her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I, I love history, world history and American history. And I want to tell you this story from history as we begin to think about the healing rest that Sabbath brings. Edmund Sears graduated from Harvard Divinity School in 1837. He began his ministry in Toledo, Ohio as a missionary back when the Ohio, the state of Ohio was a mission field. From there, he moved on to serve a church and from there to a larger congregation. He preached against slavery and he preached in support of women's equality back in 1837. One of his sermons was such a compelling argument against slavery and such a compelling argument for the abolition of slavery that it was published and distributed as a pamphlet by the abolitionists of the time. He wrote multiple books and published a magazine for 12 years. But after his first seven years of doing the hard work of ministry, Edmund Sears had a complete breakdown. He was unable to work full time and he took a part time job as a pastor. And it was during that time that Sears wrote what is certainly his most well known work, one which many of you know. It's a poem that was later set to music and became a beloved Christmas carol. Anytime I read this scripture that we just read in the Gospel of Luke, this poem comes to mind and specifically, I think of this third verse of this song that he wrote. Here's the third verse. And ye beneath life's crushing load, whose forms are bending low, who toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow, look now, for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing. Oh, rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing. 
That's the third verse of, it came upon a midnight clear, the words written by Edmund Sears back in the 1800s. When I hear that verse particularly, I think of this woman, this daughter of Abraham, a Jewish woman, whom Jesus encountered in the synagogue when she came to worship. Whatever this chronic illness was that she had, it forced her to stoop over. The original Greek manuscript says she could not lift herself up. I can't imagine how painful and exhausting and miserable this was for her. I think, though, that Edmund Sears knew what it was like to be bent low beneath life's crushing load. When he broke down after seven years of ministry, I'd guess he felt a lot like the woman in this story, unable to lift himself up. I wasn't able to find any details about that breakdown, but I can imagine that the, past, the pressures of pastoral life back then were just as great as they are today. And in fact, many of us have had that experience of being so weighed down and bent low by life that we're unable to lift ourselves up. We may not have experienced it physically, but probably we have spiritually or psychologically or emotionally. Sometimes chronic health issues or aging can feel so heavy. Family dynamics, conflicts in our community can bring us low. When grief or internal turmoil or questions shake our faith, it can seem as if our spirits are being crushed and growing weak and faltering, and we find ourselves looking down at the ground, our head down, not sure where we're going, and plagued by this relentless pain. If you've ever had to walk on icy roads or sidewalks, in the winter, which you probably have if you're in Northern Illinois, you know what that feels like. You're just bending over all the time, looking down at where your feet are, and you can't really look up and see anything else because you might fall. It just feels hard and painful. So we find ourselves in these situations, looking down at the ground, our heads down, not sure where we're going, and just plagued by this pain. Each one of us have toiled along the climbing way with painful steps and slow. And we felt that our very souls are bent low almost to the ground as we carry those heavy burdens of our lives. So we come to Jesus, unable to stand up straight, hoping to be healed. And in his hands, in his loving hands, we find restoration and we find rest for our souls. In the healing presence of Jesus, we stand up straight and we can praise God. But there's always someone, isn't there? There's always someone who carved those first four commandments into the stony surface of their hearts and forgot about the other six. They love to recite the law, at least the first four commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then they stop. They can only get not even halfway with love of God and honoring God, but they don't get to the second part that has all the love of your neighbor stuff. You know, all the stuff about... Honor your father and mother, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet. Those are all love of neighbor things. But if you don't remember them, if you only remember the first four, you're kind of stuck. And that's where these guys were. They wanted to put a stop to Jesus healing on the Sabbath. It was almost 10 years ago that Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann wrote a book that's called Sabbath as Resistance, Saying No to the Culture of Now. In that splendid book, Brueggemann wrote, in our own contemporary context of the rat race of anxiety, the celebration of Sabbath is an act of both resistance and alternative. It is resistance because it is a visible insistence 
that our lives are not defined by the production and consumption of commodity goods. Individual success is not defined by production and consumption. You're more than a consumer. You're more than a credit card. Our faith is not defined solely by how we manage revenue and expenses. Our worship might be perfectly executed and our music flawless, our administration exemplary and our budget balanced, but if we as church are not merciful, if we do not love our neighbor, if we focus only on anxiety and scarcity rather than God's grace and abundance, we've lost sight of the entire aim of being church. This is one of those places where I'm really glad to have learned Greek because in the Greek, the use, the way language gets used really enriches this story. So the temple leaders say in verse 14, if you have a Bible, you can see it in verse 14. And if you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll send you one. In verse 14, they say, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Meaning that on the Sabbath, it is necessary not to work. But Jesus answers them in verse 16, Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free on this bond, from this bondage on the Sabbath day? So they're saying what ought not to happen, and Jesus is saying what ought to happen. He's saying, in essence, you're saying that what is necessary is to not work. I'm saying that what is necessary is to not neglect the pain of this woman, this daughter of Abraham. On one side of the argument is a belief that the choice is either or. Either we honor the Sabbath or we sin by working. On the Jesus side of the argument is the both and. We honor the Sabbath with worship, to be sure, and we honor the Sabbath with acts of mercy and compassion. We do love God and we love our neighbor. Or, as Walter Brueggemann says in that book, Sabbath as Resistance, worship that does not lead to neighborly compassion and justice cannot be faithful worship of God. That offer is a phony Sabbath. Sabbath offers us the opportunity to encounter the beauty of holiness and to rest in God's transcendent presence. To remember the Sabbath and keep it holy is to forget ourselves and our definitions of success and to remember that we're story keepers who tell that story again and again of a God who is at work in the world. Honoring the Sabbath creates a rhythm in our lives reminding us that God's kingdom is at hand. And above all, Sabbath is not just a day and it's not just something we do or don't do, not an ought or ought not. It comes to us and embraces us and enfolds us in this healing rest. It lets us shake off the heavy burdens that weigh us down and stand up praising God and ready to go out and love the world. Amen.